Well, I'm very, very happy to welcome former Sergeant Dave Shaw from the Rhodesian Air Force, um, who was a technician and um, has, has a story to tell about what was going on in the workshops and more. But Dave, I just want to say to you, um, every pilot I've spoken to absolutely sings your praises and, and, and those of your colleagues. Um, what a just a remarkable bunch of guys that was um, working behind the scenes there to keep those airplanes in the air. So um, I know there are a lot of guys out there who want to hear more about your story. Um, Dave, just to start off, um, just an introduction to ERS uh, and what, what was, what was um, you know, how it all worked, just a basic introduction. Yeah, sure. It's my pleasure. Honest. First of all, thank you very much for entertaining um, uh, the idea of having us uh, from ERS give a few words. And um, just to give you uh, people a bit of background to what actually happened in uh, ERS, what transpired. And um, what, a, what a wonderful um, uh, organization we had there for, uh, for, for us, for, for me, for about four years. And I think um, for a lot longer for others. But um, yeah, thank you again, Hannes. But yeah, let me just um, maybe give a bit of a, um, a background. Yeah, as you as you said, um, just basically tell, tell ERS what, was yeah. You know, ERS, what does it stand for? Okay, ERS uh, Engine Repair Shop. Some of it referred to as Engine Repair Section, right? Yes. Which I think most people like to refer as an Engine Repair Section. Okay. Okay. And um, look, th this was very very really low key in the past. Okay. And, and um, because we didn't have, uh, how can I say, there wasn't a lot of pressure on the people we doing mainly repairs. But after um, UDI, I mean, we were forced into doing more work uh, on engines and developing them and doing full uh, overalls uh, on, on a lot of the different types that we were running uh, in our region Air Force. So, um, yeah, look, I, I just wanted to maybe, um, if, you, if, if, it's, if you would permit me, just to go through... Um, some of the role players, the people, the main um, the names of some of the people that were, were participated. That's in the last four years before um, some of us left from South Africa when Mr. Mugabe took over. Okay, and um, let me just list them. Clive Chart, Bob Mackey, George Sheeran, Johnny Green, Pete Buckle, Norman Ely, Rich Palmer, George Bushney, Guy Pierce, Ian McKenzie, Ian Ellis, Ian Doig. There are also numerous apprentices that were um, coming and going, which um, there's too many to, to mention. And um, if I have left anybody out, then uh, I'm sure they would forgive me. The main <laughs> sections in ERS, okay, we had different bays uh, which we were allocated to, okay. When we got senior ranks like sergeant, flight sergeant, and when we came to work there, they gave us a bit of a gap to settle in. But then um, we were assigned to a particular type of engine, like um, Avon 1, Avon 203, 207, the Goblins and the Lycomings in the later, later couple of years, okay? And um, we had different bays uh, which we worked in. Um, the NDT area, where non-destructive non testing, it stands for NDT. Uh, the Cobretta Bay, um, the Blade Bay, Spray Booth Cleaning and Inspection Bay. Those are the bays that we were, um, we were, if we were lucky to uh, to, to actually um, make an impression or to make sure that the, um, we, did, we did spark with the job, um, we were given our own bays uh, and um, obviously a couple of apprentices to work under us. Dave, um, just um, what, what, what engines were you, were you working on? Uh, just a little bit more about the actual engines. Okay, the, I gave a list there earlier. Um, we had the Avon ones. The, the main, the, the main in, in, engines uh, we we were cons, uh, we were involved in was the Avon ones, which were fitted to the Canberra bombers. Right. The Avon two hundred seven, the Avon two hundred seven, which was fitted to the Hunter for um, Hunter jet, and the Goblins, um, which were fitted to the Vampires. Okay. Okay, and and prior to UDI, things were. It, it wasn't, it was relatively plain sailing. After UDI, um, you had to start making a plan, as it were, because uh, sanctions, uh, no, you know, not easy to import any spares. Correct. Um, you're 100% right there. Um, yeah, we were, we were, um, 
basically ostracized by the British government and some people that, was, that would support them. So we had to go on our own and try and get spares from wherever we could, uh, whether it be secondhand or new. So this was quite a challenge in general. And um, it was it became um, the most difficult part of the job that we had to um, to, to, to set down there at, at the engine repair shop. Dave, everybody um, talks about the morale and uh, the team spirit um, amongst the technical guys. Um, you obviously got along well. Um, the morale was high. Yes, uh, Hannes, you, you're dead right there. Com camaraderie was second to none. Um, people would stick together. No backstabbing and teamwork was the, was the essence of, of um, our whole um, uh, being there it's, uh, most of the time. You know, I'll give you an example. Um, we had, um, you know, in the times that we had off, which wasn't often, we used to a lot of the time leave work, uh, leave home at um, so around six in the morning, get picked up by one of the Air Force uh, combis. And then we'd go to um, work about six, get to there before seven. And then we'd probably leave there after six or seven in the evening, depending on uh, the pressure that was put on us, you know. So um, uh, it, it was, we would, we would have great times of playing sport. I did rugby and we did volleyball and some other sports for um, other people like soccer. So it was, um, it was a case of we had to have that relaxation because of the long hours we were working. So um, part of the um, uh, my, my background is having to you know doing sport, which was rugby for my in my case rugby and volleyball, and um, we had the volleyball team in ERS, and Wednesday afternoons mainly was a time where we could go and uh, have fun and for a couple of hours, you know, in after two o'clock in the afternoon. So we'd start work as usual, like five or six in the morning, we'd end up going play volleyball and relaxing. Uh, you know, it was a part of relaxation. And, um, and Joe, I'm sure you're going to show so one of the pictures that I'm going to give you, but of a volleyball team from ERS, uh, which was nine players. Generally, we used to just swap. We had six players in the team, obviously. And, you know, we managed to win the, um, the cup, the best players from 78 to 80, I think it was, three years in a row. Um, it was great. Um, and, and, yeah, we... You're, I'm sure you will show the picture. But then also, you know, the, um, the camaraderie, like I said to you, um, the, um, like when my first child was born, I got married and the, my first child was born and the guys had a whip around um, and got some clothing and gave us the, um, you know, presented. And that's normally a woman's job, you know, is to, um, is to supply um, the, the buddies, uh, wives and that with, with gifts. But all the guys got together. That was just to go to show you what, the camaraderie was um, amongst the guys. Dave, I'm sure you you felt you you were faced with a lot of challenges, but um, big ones that sort of stick in your memory. Um, big tasks that you really had to pull out all stops to overcome. Um, anything that springs to mind? Um, yeah, there's, there's quite a few instances. Um, yeah, the. Uh, I tell you mainly um, getting spares, like we, we actually mentioned already, getting spares, robbing from, from other engines, which was quite a frequent, um, uh, how can I say, it? A, a, a frequent uh, task for us. Like we had a lot of engines that were um, acquired. So we had this in a big area in a, one of the hangars next to the, near the store. And then um, we would go and rob a part off there and just make sure, give it a crack check if we had to. Um, for close inspection according to the, to the manual. The manuals, and then we'd have to um, make sure that the that part was serviceable, properly serviceable, according to the, the manuals to fit into an, 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 an engine which we uh, we were working on. Yeah, the uh, also implementing correct procedures, right, according to the manuals, because now all of a sudden we were confronted with um, with having to do overalls rather than just repairing the certain parts of the airplane, uh, the engine, should we say. So that was quite a challenge as well, and we had to have the manuals, make sure the manuals were up to date. Okay, and make sure the manuals, the, man, the maintenance manuals up to date, and also the spares manual, all types of, of engines. So, yeah, that was, a, you know, you get service bulletins and you get some um, ADs, uh, airworthiness directors, which you have to uh, ensure on each engine uh, is, is, um, is carried out. Because you don't want to assemble an engine um, that needs extra work and stuff that comes up from the manufacturer that needs to be adhered to. Um, otherwise, you might have a safety issue with a particular engine. Um, other challenges, yeah, vibration. 
We had major issues, especially with the Goblin engines, um, with vibration. And we had to ensure that when we worked on a um, particular engine, the compressors and the turbines were well balanced before assembly. Otherwise, your whole job would go um, down the tubes um, and you would, um, you would end up having to strip the engine again and rebalance everything. So we had to do static balancing and then dynamic balancing, but at the end to make sure the, the compressors and turbines were up to scratch. Um, yeah, the, um, yeah the, I think that was the biggest challenge we had was the vibration challenge throughout uh, the, engine, uh, the, the engine work that we had to do. Dave, did you, um, did you spend any time in the field um, having to deal with aircraft away from the workshops? Not really, not in my case. We, I did go out to do a couple of recoveries, helicopter recoveries, okay? But basically, um, the, um, yeah, the, we, were, we were assigned to the engine shop, right? So we didn't have time to go to be sent away into the field where other guys would have to go away to take engines out and put them back in. Um, do airframe um, work and do particular, uh, like if you had a bird strike on an engine, they'd go and uh, blend the blades in, in the field, stuff like that. But um, we were assigned in the engine shop, so we didn't, we didn't have time to do, do that, sort of, uh, that sort of work and go out in the field at all. Now, with the hunters, um, some parts were being coming in through the back door from Oman. Um, yes. I don't know. Uh, did, did did guys go from the Rhodesian Air Force to Oman to, to pick up the spares? How did how did it work? Do you do you know? Yeah, it's it's quite good that you've um, it's quite uh, great that you've actually brought that up, Honest, because I've I've got a, um, a letter or a, um, a printout here from Rich Palmer. He was involved in in um, going across to Oman to collect engines okay. and, and parts. For the hunters. So um, if you like, I can go through that letter now, or do you want me to do the direct letter? No, that'd be good. Yeah, particularly. So that's a very interesting um, part of the story, I think, is the Omani connection. Okay, let me do that now. Let me go through this. Um, now, this uh, this is a this is a one and a half pages or one and a quarter pages of, um, of a write-up uh, and summary that Rich Palmer sent me. Um, and he said, please go ahead and use it um, if we'd like for the interview. And yeah. so I'll just read this. Uh, read through it um, word for word. Um, okay, so this is a contribution by Richard Palmer, a flight sergeant in the aircraft engine repair section. Okay, then he goes on his first paragraph. In 1979, the Air Force had several of the original 12 hunters on the ground, desperately short of Avon 207 engines. In early October 1979, Bob Mackey and Rich Palmer departed from Salisbury on a flight to Johannesburg, where they were met by SA officials asking to surrender, asked to surrender their passports and we issued with two foreign passports, which had been sanitized of, a, of any Rhodesian connections and recorded them as being globetrotters, uh, globetrotting salesmen from the UK. Once briefed, they were on a flight to Paris. Rich is still in possession of that passport. To suit their businessman image, they flew first class on a Gulf air flight to Muscat in Oman spending most of the overnight flight at the bar, being served by, by the on-duty air stations. On the arrival in Oman, Bob sailed through the customs, but Rich was detained by an excitable little uh, Arabic fellow. Rich found himself in a, in a side room, wondering how he was going to talk his way out of this mess. After several phone calls to high authority, he was released and caught up with Bob, who was waiting in a taxi ready to gap it. <laughs> it was then a short inter internal flight from Muscat to coastal town of Salala, where they were based for the remainder of their stay. They hired our vehicle and traveled about 100 k's across desert to, daily to uh, um, Thamrat Air Force Base. This was done to avoid socializing with the POMs working for British air, air work at Thumrat. Thumrat Air Force Base had similar working hours as Thornhill, um, as it was a colorful, colorful sight to see many members spending their afternoons land sailing on the runway. Okay, a number of hunters had recently flown in from an unknown country, probably Jordan, 
and takes it to the far end of the runway to be buried in the sand later by front-end loaders. It was now the job of the two ERS members to part the fuselages of four aircraft and remove the engines on site. All the hunters' tooling was provided by the, to have been an open secret on the base. Once the engines were removed and secured on transport stands, Bob and Rich returned to the hotel to await further notification or instructions and continue <clears throat> enjoying the seafood delicacies and fine wines. <clears throat> the two eventually received the message to be at the airfield on a certain evening and at midnight. Jack Mullock's DCC-8 landed at Thurmrod with the assistance of a non-Brit operating the forklift and the DC-8's engine still running at the end of the runway. They quickly loaded the hunting engines into the freight, freighter and departed. Once airborne, Bob and Rich found a couple of engine covers to sleep on or under for their return flight to Rhodesia. The holiday was over. The next task uh, for ERS was to complete overall. To, okay, sorry. Um, once um, the next task of ERS was to completely overhaul the engines and get them back into service ASAP. As a young ERS technician, Rich, Rich was not aware of the complexities that must have gone into securing the, those engines for Rhodesia, but with hindsight and reading Alan Brow's book, Jack Mullock's, Jack Mullock, Legend of the African Skies. He is convinced that many foreign intelligence agencies and militaries were sympathetic to Rhodesia's cause and assisted greatly behind the scenes. Alan's book also mentions the sourcing of hunter main plans and tail sections from Oman. He can only assume that members from ASS also had an equally interesting holiday at some point. It was at the time when every operation was on a need to know basis and no one discussed sensitive information, even amongst themselves. So we thank Rich for that. Thanks. Thank you very much for um, having that input for the interview. Uh, Dave, so just get, uh, you broke up a bit there. So. So these aircraft came in probably from Jordan, landed in Oman. Yes, I would say so, yeah. Yes. And they then took the engines out. Correct. And those engines were they, then... The, um, they, they were then shipped to South Africa with Jack Mullock's um, airplane, the DCA. And, there, and you said, did you say there were 14 hunters that came in? So 14 engines were removed. No, there were four. Sorry? No, they, were, they just confirmed there were four, and not, not 14, four. Four. Okay. Four engines, yeah. Four engines that were taken off and, and shipped. Okay, yeah. You, you know, the, this would have the guy behind this uh, would have been Tim Landon, who uh, became known as the White Sultan. He was the man who virtually came to power with um, in the coup in in Oman, and his brother was farming in Marindellis. Um and that's that. That's where the connection was, and it was Tim Landon who, who would have set this this whole this whole uh, um, whole operation up. Okay, um, I didn't. I wasn't aware of that. In fact, you know, all the all the information that was given to Richard, uh, I don't think many of us know about it. I discussed it with Ian um, this evening. We didn't. Both of us do nothing about this, so that was very really hush hush. And even the guys now um, don't talk much about it. Dave, just, uh, I mean, all the engines you were working on were, were British-made engines. Um, did, 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 did any of the Brits come in through the back door to help you guys, or did you just figure it out um, how, to, how to work on these things without any expert assistance from the manufacturers? No, we had no, um, we had no help from the bombs at all, nothing. Um, the Brits to us no help. The thing is, we were very well trained, okay? We had um, the training school there, which trained us uh, in, in um, engines, airframes, because we, in the Air Force, we were separate trade. We were not dual trade as we they do in South Africa. South Africa, you have to have engine and airframe as a trade. You have to qualify for both of them. So we only had, we were trained in engines. So we were very well trained. Um, in fact, a guy, a gentleman by the name of Sid Watson, was a lecturer at the ground training school. He taught us and he taught us very, very well. So we were very adaptable to um, uh, to to challenges like this, 
And, um, you know, the engine types, like I said before, we were each, uh, we each had a different engine type to work on, which made it, make it, made it, slightly, make, made it slightly easier. And once you took one or two of them and reassemble one or two of them, you got to know them very well, but very quickly. So it was, um, it was very fun and it was a challenge. We all loved it. We were all still very young. So we took up the challenge and, um, and made the most of it. Uh, Dave, just one last question. Um, how much interaction did you have with, with the pilots? Uh, did, you, did you see much of them? Um, or was it, you know, were you very distant from one another? Yeah, we, I wouldn't say we were too distant. We, um, if we were, you know, some of us were on squadrons um, throughout the, our careers there, on and off. So at the times we were on the squadrons, we got quite um, close with the pilots. And um, but we, you know, with military stuff like this, and uh, not not like um, in um, the, the civilian world, uh, you are automatically separated because you one's a one one is a normal technician, and the other one is a pilot. Okay, and we, we did different courses, and that and we were sort of um, we would we were uh, we had to learn to have the respect and saluting and stuff. So we didn't get that close to the pilots. Most of us, but at times we we were involved with them with giving decisions on the on the squadrons, but not, not in, in the engineer pay shop. No, uh, not not much not much um, uh, going goings about with the, with the pilots. And okay, Dave, just uh, just to round it off. Um, so you stayed till nineteen eighty, right till the end. You you were in the air force. Yeah, um, I think it was in March. It was announced that um, Robert McGarvey got into power. And um, already I had been down to uh, to South Africa and uh, organized an interview with them. I, uh, I get my, got myself uh, an interview and I went and worked at the, in the compressor and turbine uh, rebuild section and they did subsequent balancing, uh, balancing on, on, on those units. And it was all the South African aeroplanes uh, that were going through uh, the engine shop there. So did you go to the South African Air Force after you left? No, it was Atlas Aircraft Corporation, oh, okay. um, which did that was yeah, they they did all the all the engine work and some a lot of airframe work as well uh, for the Air Force at that time. Uh, very interesting. Well, Dave, thank you very much indeed for your time. Um, I really really appreciate it, and uh, I'll um, I'll move on to the other guys and uh, try and get more of the story. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Lars. Thanks for entertaining us and. Um, uh, looking forward to, to um, listening to the whole um, the whole interview. That'll be great.